Hello, everyone. This is John Byrne with Poets and Quants. Welcome to our online MBA backstage event. We have four terrific schools with us right now. Uh, schools that all of you will know uh, if you're familiar with the space, and even if you're not. Uh, let me introduce our panelists, and we'll get right to it. We have Sarah Wagner from uh, Indiana Kelly School of Business. It's a Kelly Direct program. It's a online MBA. We have from the University of Washington in Seattle. And look at that beautiful picture behind her, uh, Jody Farwell. Hi, Jody. We have uh, Megan Rogers from the Jack Welch Management Institute. And uh, as you know, I'm a big uh, Jack Welch fan, uh, having collaborated with him on his uh, biography. Uh, I think I even have it here. How about that? Um, so welcome, uh, Megan. Thanks, John. And, <laughs> and we have from Hofstra in New York City, uh, Kaushik Sengupta, uh, who's a professor of management and associate dean uh, at uh, Hofstra. Welcome, everybody. So um, let's, let's start from the very beginning. Uh, let's talk about when your program was actually founded and how it's evolved uh, since its founding. Uh, and Sarah, why don't we go to you? Because I, th I think you may have, uh, having launched in 1999, um, the oldest program among this bunch. Yes. <laughs> as far as we know, we were first to market in, in 99. And uh, since then, the program has actually changed quite a bit. So we got started um, and kind of the more traditional at the time, uh, a little more um, kind of the correspondence course type of model, but really pretty quickly pivoted into uh, something that's similar to what we have today, which is online learning primarily, but supplemented by virtual live class sessions. So nowadays, uh, we, we really have a very robust model of coursework that is online supplemented by residencies and then again supplemented by virtual online class sessions that are a required component of the program that our students have really um, let us given us really good feedback on that they enjoy being able to connect with their faculty and their colleagues once per week and the program also started um, with a different credit amount and kind of different courses required and in uh 2019 actually we launched relaunched an entirely brand new curriculum so the program has changed quite a bit as far as coursework and, and credits and things like that. So now we're a 54 credit online MBA that still incorporates though a lot of the things, uh, the highlights that we started with, which were uh, that interaction with your faculty and your peers weekly so that you get a chance to kind of meet with folks on a regular basis, as well as our residencies and our immersion programs and our student clubs and our organizations. So we've kind of uh, throughout the years, we've had the same basic tenants and then just kind of adjusted and, and uh, fit it to what students needed at the time. Yeah, and we'll get into more detail about the changes that occurred in 2019 because they were pretty dramatic mm -hmm. uh, later on in the session. Uh, Jody, when did Washington get into the game? And, and you specifically uh, market your program as a hybrid program, not as a merely online program. Now, give us the sense of that and when it was founded. You bet. Yeah, we founded in 2017 um, with an initial class of 45 students. Um, we, our current class has 88 students, so we've doubled <laughs> in four years um, and expecting a, a, a class of 88 for our fifth cohort as well. Um, so yeah, we've, you know, I, I've been here at Foster uh, almost two years now, and, and since I've been here, some of the things that we've done um, to advance the program really has been around student engagement, honestly. Um, we've created a student council that started this fall. Um, it has nine members on it, uh, seven from our second years and two from our first years. And it really gives them a sense of ownership um, into the program and some um, representation as well. Um, and from that, we've created two, two student groups, our Justice, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion student group. And we also have a hybrid mental health student group and just launching a veterans and business group um, that's gonna be uh, students across three programs here at Foster, MBA programs. And then hopefully next year we'll be launching a women and allies in business too. Um, in addition to you know, the student council for student engagement, we've really tried to engage our alumni more too. So we've created a, an alumni board 
Um, and we've also created an alumni audit program where students can come back and audit any of the courses, elective maybe they didn't get a take or maybe a couple years down the road because we're doing constant um, curriculum refresh, they will want to come back and take one of the core classes they took. And this last quarter, we had over 20 students, alumni, uh, audit courses. So that was pretty exciting. And the faculty are super excited to see the students come back. Um, then the other thing we really focus a lot on um, is just, um, you know, the original design was to look at the curriculum every two to three years. And, and it was just, that's just, you know, too much time goes by. So we do curriculum refresh literally at the end of every quarter. And, and honestly, kind of throughout the quarter. Um, we have an amazing instructional design team that meet with the faculty after each of their immersion sessions or Zoom sessions and just goes over um, you know, what, went, work, what worked, what didn't. One of the big things we've been working on is really student engagement in the classroom. So we're actually charting how much time the professor is talking and how much time the student's talking. And so that they can see a balance. So we can say, you know, gosh, 80% of the students got to speak um, in, your, in your Zoom session tonight, um, how do we get those other 20% to speak? Um, and you, know, you spoke about 50% of the time. Is that the balance you're looking for? And this feedback for the faculty has been really helpful for them and, and the students have noticed it too. Um, and then the other thing I would say, we really focused on career events. Um, we've doubled our career events this last year and um, held over 700 one-on-one -on -one career coach, coaching sessions. So um, really student engagement is, is kind of been our focus this last couple of years. Yeah, I, and I think that uh, just listening to that, it gives me a sense of my goodness, uh, you're breaking down all kinds of misperceptions about an online learning experience. Uh, you know, you might not think you have clubs and organizations that you can attend if, if you go online. Uh, not true. You may, may think that you may have less access to career services and professional development. Uh, not true. Um, you, you, you know, so it's, uh, it's pretty remarkable how far along online MBA programming has really become. Absolutely. Uh, Kosick, uh, how long ago did Hofstra get into the game of online MBA? Uh, we started in 2011. So this is about 10, 11 years since we started. And we were actually one of the first movers in the New York area in the online space, that is. And uh, our program traditionally has stayed small through the years, you know, by design, actually, we didn't want it to be a too large of a program, again, because of some of the, uh, some of what Jody kind of mentioned to and uh, in terms of the, the aspect of giving the service to the students just beyond the online courses that they're doing. So very similar to, to what we have here also, which is the career services are open to the online MBA students, they are welcome to come to campus, we have actually three or four residencies, you know, during the duration of the program where they're actually meeting face to face. Of course, last year was a challenge with the COVID. So we still did it. And um, interestingly enough, the, the group that started last fall was the largest group ever with almost 70 students, which is actually double the size of what we normally have had through the years. Oh. Um, but the point is that I feel that they have actually done the networking almost at the same level or probably are, they're actually better known to each other just because of what has been going on through the last year. So, so we kind of look at that as, again, similarly that um, these are all asynchronous more delivery for us. Uh, we do have some synchronous components. It's not a required component for our courses, actually, because most of our students uh, are actually full-time working professionals and many of them, we have a very focused program on healthcare actually. So um, where we get a lot of the doctors and nurse managers to come into the program. So they need the flexibility. And so, um, but they also want the value out of the networking and you know the on-campus experience that they get. So uh, curriculum changes wise, we recently revised our MBA. Um, which is now a 36th grade program down from about 45 credits. We kind of did it for two purposes. One is to shorten the time to graduation and also to allow students within the original 45 grade structure to, to add in like a second concentration, you know, so as businesses are looking for more than one skill set area. So, so that has been a pretty good uh, hit for us in the last year or so. Uh, we also made significant resource um, you know, uh, sort of investments in revamping completely the courses in the program, you know, so they are now, uh, as somebody else was mentioning, a fantastic group of instructional designers, you know, um, who actually work with the faculty one on one, and really bring the courses to life, essentially, and it's been like day and night compared to what we used to have before.
So that's been, those have been the two major changes, I think, over the last couple of years. Now, you mentioned two words that we all know in the industry, but many people outside may not know, and that's synchronous and asynchronous. Now, yeah. uh, why don't you explain what an asynchronous uh, course is or a class and what a synchronous class might be? So, yeah, that's a good point. You know, we always say that, okay, everybody should know this term and we, are, we assume that everybody knows the term, but that's not the case. So the asynchronous scenario is basically as the professor, I'm giving the class the material for the week. Um, they can decide when they want to go through the material during the week, understanding from the student's perspective that there are multiple deadlines during the week. So it, it's not remotely close to where I'm checking on them at the end of the week and I don't really care about what's going on during the week. No, because they have to contribute to interactive discussion forums, group work, case discussions and so on. And it's asynchronous because I'm not asking them to come at a particular time of the day or the day of the week online to kind of go through the material. Versus synchronous, obviously, as uh, Sarah was pointing out, like, you know, uh, that, uh, that you ask the class to come online on a Zoom session uh, during a particular time during, during the week, that is. And we do have that component, but it's a very small component of the program. Again, understanding our student body where even if I schedule something at eight o'clock on a Thursday evening, not everybody in the class may be able to attend because they are doing evening shifts uh, and they have other schedules that might conflict and so on. So we don't want to get into the way of the flexibility of the program from how the students actually going through the courses. But there is a lot of interactivity in an asynchronous course. Um, and as a professor, I'll tell you that we do end up spending a lot more time teaching an online course than we do an in-person class. So, um, so yeah, so you're not missing out on any part of the actual course delivery and the experience. Good. <laughs> Megan, tell us how long the Jack Welch program has been now. Uh, we've been around uh, since uh, 2010, mm -hmm. um, always 100% online. Uh, and thank you, Kashik, for explaining that term and always uh, asynchronous. Uh, like Hofstra, you know, our program was built to, to support working adults. Um, so we always felt that the asynchronous format obviously offers the utmost in flexibility. Um, people can really take classes anywhere, anytime, anywhere um, in the world. Um, I think in terms of how our program has changed, it's probably interesting to say how it has and how it hasn't. Um, number one, um, the program was really built, you know, with a student-centric focus. Um, you know, we really use a lot of traditional customer service metrics that are actually used in, in business, namely the net promoter score. Um, and that's really over the years helped us refine all of our courses, launch new concentrations and really build a unique environment for the students and alumni of the Jack Welch Management Institute. We have about 2000 students right now and 2700 alumni and just achieved our highest net promoter score of 81 uh, this past quarter. So. Um, we've been able to, you know, grow and create a very diverse environment uh, by keeping our class sizes small um, and that one-on-one -on -one attention. Um, and then also at the same time, I think probably the two most significant changes, obviously when we first launched, we were a leader, we had a leadership focused MBA that is still our quote unquote core MBA, but we have since launched concentrations in healthcare, HR, uh, and actually just this year operations management as well as a suite of other certificate type of offerings for folks who may not be willi willing um, or ready to jump in you know, into the full-time program. I think the other most exciting thing about um, JWMI is that it really has become a global classroom. About 20% of our students are outside of the United States um, from all different levels you know, within different organizations. So it's really created this diverse community within the classroom. Uh, and then and based on response to that, we've been able to do a lot of other things, build a very robust student um, and alumni networking opportunity. Um, you know, pre-COVID, well, I used to like to say we would bring the, we would like bring the best of uh, online on ground. We can't do that right now, but we have leaned in more into providing supplemental opportunities, uh, both in networking, um, lifelong learning sessions, um, you know, as we, you know, on a more regular basis, we hold, we held about 75 of these events last year. Um, and when we move back on ground, we have a network of about 50 uh, folks in global cities um, that will be there to repick up that, that networking experience. So it's, um, it's definitely been an exciting ride over the past 10 years. And it's fun to see the school still 
you know, adding new, um, you know, new concentrations and really responsive to the student input as we build our future for the next phase. So a lot of people would be wondering, oh my goodness, I have a demanding job full time. I work more than 40 hours a week. I have family obligations. I've got to fix stuff around the house on the weekends. How in the world am I going to be able to fit a graduate management program into that already busy schedule? So Megan, can you give us a sense of what kind of commitment a person has to make and what a week in the life of a student at the Jack Welch Management Institute might be like? Sure. Um, so we, we tell folks when they're considering it, I think, you know, Kashik mentioned this earlier, that I think there's, you know, perception that sometimes online is easier. It's really not. Um, you know, in a traditional classroom, you may have been able to hide in the back and not raise your hand, but in order to, you know, actually get credit for participating, you're literally participating multiple times a week and you're getting feedback from your faculty member and your peers at a much greater rate than you would um, on ground. Um, so we tell students, you know, you should, you should average about 10 to 15 hours, depending on the number of classes that you take. JWMI is 12 courses. Most students will take, uh, you know, a course or sometimes double up. So, um, you know, they're, we're telling them, okay, hey, up front, really based on their schedule, like one, defining the expectations and two, letting them know that, you know, 15 hours is in for, to your point, John, is not always easy for, for folks to find you know, um, in their schedule. And we really work with them, you know, to uh, really when they come on with their advisors to help them actually physically map out how that might occur. Um, so as I'm sure as, you know, as my peers would say, you know, it really depends on the individual um, in terms of how, you know, students manage, you know, their, um, their coursework. I mean, if, if we were in the times of where folks are commuting and um, all of our, you know, all of our courses are mobile accessible, we, you know, you'd have people listening to lectures you know, either on the train or in the car and kind of, you know, getting that done at the same time. But, um, you know, obviously with a lot of folks at home, uh, you know, it's, it's really been very interesting to see how they've, you know, navigated that course, um, you know, th that schedule and the feedback that we get is just help that, you know, it's helped them become much better at time management. Um, so, you know, we've got, like I said, some folks like to do their coursework early in the morning. Sometimes, you know, folks uh, are doing it late at night. Um, and we find that the people that are most successful in the program are the ones who are really, um, you know, talking about and taking the commitment seriously and socializing it either with their families or their employers so that they can get that support and flexibility that they need. Yeah. So my sense is that your week in the life is incredibly flexible. It is. Uh, you do the work <laughs> when you can. I'm sure there are deadlines for assignments and, yeah. and things like that and times when you, you have to meet with your study group. Um, but there's no set time where you basically have to be uh, there. Yeah, and that's the, you know, if, if you are in an asynchronous model, I mean, that's how it works. So to right. your point, John, our deadlines are Wednesdays and Sundays. So we find that students will often, you know, they'll, they'll split their week up, right? So they're working towards Wednesday, they might get a breather, and then they'll dedicate some time on Saturday or Sunday, um, you know, to be able to do, you know, to do the coursework. And I think it's just a testament to our faculty, um, which not to put a plug for the poets and quants rankings, but I, you know, our faculty, I think have swept the rankings uh, from the student feedback perspective a couple years in a row now, but that's really due to the testament also the flexibility of our faculty. Again, the class sizes are relatively small. Most of our, um, you know, faculty members are only teaching one class um, because they're also in many respects working themselves. They're all academically qualified. So again, we really try to work around the student. Um, and if the student you know, needs to you know, jump on at a certain time of the day, um, we manage our faculty schedule so that we can make sure that we're supporting them kind of when and where they need. Right, great. And I'm assuming that a Hofstra, because of the asynchronous nature of the program largely, it's a similar thing in terms of a, a week in the life of an online MBA student. That's correct, uh, John. I think, and I'll, I'll just add to uh, Megan's points on the asynchronous model. As I was telling you all that we have a large proportion of a student body who are in healthcare. And last year actually was a testament to the asynchronous model because we did have a lot of doctors who, are, who were actually emergency room frontline doctors uh, during the last spring cycle between March and let's say June or July. 
And I, as a director of the program, really did not have a sense as to how many of them would really continue, how many of them would drop out or take a temporary leave of absence. And it's a testament to the fact of them more than us, really, that 100% of those students actually continued through the program. Yes, we, we built in some flexibility in there to allow a few folks who really could not carry on during the course and with the course during that first two or three months last year. But you know, this is actually the first cohort who's graduating this May from last year, who is finishing up within the original time frame that they signed up for. You know, and I think they'll tell you that um, the flexibility through the asynchronous model and with some flexibility customized based on a particular student's needs really work well for them. And uh, in a few cases, they just said, I simply cannot do this, you know, during that period of time. And we said, okay, you take a little bit more time to finish the course, get an incomplete and do it over the summer, which is really what happened. So, but I think coming back to Megan's point, yes, you do need to budget, you know, again, it depends on the individual person but you do need to budget like a couple of hours each day at whatever time is convenient for you around your every, every other schedule mm -hmm. to fit in that time. And you do need that 14 to 15 hours per week to add on. And right. I'm talking about 14, 15 hours for, we, we usually have an average load of two courses for seven weeks in our program. So they're taking two courses for seven weeks. If they're in the full-time mode, they go on to another two courses in the second seven weeks of the semester. But if they're doing part time, then they may be taking one and one so that the model is a lot of flexible. Um, but the max they get is two courses, which is where the 15 hours comes in roughly. Right. And now, Sarah, I know you have uh, live weekly classes. So what's what's a week in the life of an MBA student at Kelly Direct? Sure. So we actually have kind of we, we've taken the best of both worlds, I guess, of synchronous and asynchronous. Uh, because we certainly have a little bit of both. Our students are doing asynchronous work, you know, outside of kind of our virtual classroom hour time. And similar in the time frame to the other schools, we normally tell students, you're going to want to budget in your time around 10 hours per week per course. But obviously that's flexible. So some weeks it's going to be more, some weeks less. Um, and normally our students are in two courses at a time. So they normally take six credits per quarter. Um, so anywhere between 15 and 20 hours per week of kind of work. And that includes your virtual class time. So we normally have per course an hour and 15 minutes per week per course for that virtual class time. And again, best of both worlds in that we have students who have said to us many times, I love touching base. I'm a student who I need something that's really holding me to, you know, I need my feet held to the fire sometimes. Uh, I want to be able to have a, a, a timeline of, hey, this is when I'm going to see my faculty member. I got to be ready with XYZ uh, components for this project, or I'm going to be seeing my team members in class on that evening. I want to be able to chat with them about our project. So we have kind of those hour and 15 minute sessions. And for our core courses, we offer those at um, 6 p.m., 7.30 p.m. or 9 p.m. Eastern. So we're offering students in different time zones opportunities to connect at different times. Um, and again, our faculty are fully aware that that's their opportunity to really have the students engage. So we do kind of a flipped classroom model where we're doing anything that the professor needs to lecture about that's done outside of that hour and 15 minutes. The hour and 15 minutes is more of a networking opportunity around the topic area that's being covered that night. So it's not that you're getting lectured at during that hour and 15 minutes, you're actually engaging in some small group projects, you're engaging in doing shared uh, Google documents together and really making that hour and 15 minutes a value add opportunity. So it feels like that's your opportunity to engage with your faculty and your colleagues. And our faculty teach all of those live class sessions themselves. So we're not utilizing um, additional professors or facilitators of live sessions. Um, you're getting the same person who's grading your work, the same person who is designing your course, the same person who is assigning your work is the same person who's teaching you in those live sessions as well as of course, lectures outside of those sessions. Great. And, and, and Jody, what's a week in the life of your student? We're a little bit different. We're a little bit more structured than, than some of the programs here today. Um, we're a team-based lockstep program, um, you know, two years, six quarters. Um, and we found that this, you know, and this is really important for students. I hope they're paying attention because this is how you pick the program that best fits for you. If you want a much more flexible program versus a program that's a little bit more lockstep and a little bit less flexible sense. Um, so the great thing about our program is that it's team-based. So the students get put into teams 
And there's with the team, the, the whole two years during the program, this team creates such a huge foundation of support for them that this, you know, they literally become like a family. Um, and you mentioned work-life balance, um, you know, gosh, throughout the two years, um, students married, divorced, there's illnesses, death, um, job changes, moving across country, all these things happen. And that team-based structure is really what gets them through that quarter after quarter. And students come back and tell me that. We have two courses on building effective teams, which really help. They build, build a charter. They work through um, you know, tough conversations about how to build an effective team dur during those two quarters. So, and it's funny, I just had a student uh, emailed me. He tracked the hours um, that he did each week and it came out to about 20 hours a week. So that's direct, direct from a student. Um, so we have two, what we call Foster Live, where students meet with um, their, their classmates um, and the professor on Tuesdays and Wednesday evenings. Um, um, you know, mostly Tuesdays, but some Wednesdays. And then they also have review sessions with the, a TA or a faculty member or both on Thursdays. Those are optional and recorded. All this is, re is recorded. The Foster Live, uh, of course, where the class time is, um, is required. Um, and then the rest of the week, they're working on team, um, team projects together. They set up team meetings. Um, they, you know, create their deliverables and submit those generally um, on Sundays or so. But um, yeah, much more of a lockstep program. We also, the program provides, we give them a two-year schedule so that they know exactly what's coming up and prepared. Um, we register them each quarter for their courses because they're taking the same courses together. Um, we provide them their textbooks, mail them to them. We give them a peer mentor from the second year, a mentors a team in the first year. That really helps um, along that process too. Um, so yeah, I think, um, you know, our, our, our program's a little bit more structured, but I, you know, we, we get a hundred percent graduation rate because of that too. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I think this is wonderful because it just shows you the different options that people have, uh, to fit into the schedule to, you know, a lot of people talk about fit. Well, here's a good example of a fit. Do you want a very structured program? It's a straight two years. Uh, and Jody, that's what you have. You yep. want one with a little more stretch. You know, if I get really busy and I want to uh, push it, stuff off, I could do that. You want it live, you want it purely online, uh, you know, which is a wonderful thing. We love variety, we love options. <laughs> now, uh, tell me if I were to meet with your students, what are the three things that seem to most resonate with them about the program? things that they take away and they say, boy, I'm really glad I was able to do blank. Jody? Um, I think the first thing you'd hear about is, is their experiences at our face-to-face -face immersions. Um, it is such a fun, it's, it's the most tiring four days at the beginning of every quarter um, that they'll experience and I've experienced. And when we could be on campus, um, they were so amazing because um, they meet with the, you know, they meet in their class, they take class during the day. We also have career development, professional development for them during the day. Um, in the evenings, we have socials and networking opportunities with other foster MBAs um, and, and, the first, and the two classes get to get to know each other as well. Um, so I would say that's one of the most special things um, they always yeah, leave talking and that's about. That's an extended weekend once a quarter on campus, right? Yeah, so at the beginning of every quarter, they show up around Wednesday um, and then they leave Sunday afternoon. So it's intense. The whole, I mean, we're, we're on campus from 7 a.m. in the morning till 10, 11 at night we, uh, when we finally leave for our social. So they're a long, long, a long four days <laughs> for sure. Yeah. So but but essential, essential to who we are, honestly, that's the hybrid model, right? So, yeah. um, and, 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 and you know, this last year because of COVID, we haven't really had that opportunity. So for our our, our student classes that started this fall, they haven't had the chance to really, yeah. you know, to meet each other face to face. We've met via Zoom, of course, but um, and to create that that experience virtually is harder, much harder than being here on campus. And what really resonated with me is just how important these face to face immersions are. And as soon as we can get back to that. Um, you know, the, the, will be who are, who we were designed to be again. Um, and then I think the other thing, you know, as I mentioned too, that the, that the students would talk about, um, is, you know, their team, like I said, they become like a family. 
Um, and um, there's such a great support structure. And, um, you know, we asked them when I came on board um, if they wanted to, you know, break, you know, switch teams at the end of the first year. And they all said, no, we don't. Like this, we built this strong support structure and we want to go the full two years with it. And the wonderful thing is when they get into their electives, they take five electives in the second year. Um, and of course, they, they're not with their teams at that point because everybody takes different electives. So sure. that's when they really get the opportunity to get to know their other classmates. Um, and they're super excited about that. Um, and so that's a great opportunity. And then I think the other thing is just the other options we provide for them, international study tour. When we were able to do that, the students just talk about what a wonderful experience that is. We also have company treks where our students get to go with one another um, to Austin, Texas or Portland or come back here to Seattle. Um, and we go into companies and really um, spend a day getting to know their culture and meet with their leadership. And, and it's just a great experience for the students. So, and, and just creates that opportunity for student engagement, um, networking too. Um, so yeah, I think all those are, I think those would be the three things students would say. Great. Megan, what are the three magical things at the Jack Welp Man Management Institute? Yeah, I mean, so uh, I think the first is, you know, students often pair it back to us, but we've marketed them up front, which is this very learn today, apply tomorrow model. Um, you know, from a curriculum perspective, um, I'd like to call it practical theory. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, folks are, you know, from day one in the class, um, obviously we have, a, we hold our students in high regard, they're working adults, they don't have time to waste if they're not getting a lot out of their classroom experience. So up and down the board, we hear that, you know, from our students and just countless examples of how the curriculum was built to really be a safe space for them to explore things that they're, you know, struggling with at work or opportunities, bring them into the classroom and then use the faculty um, and their peers to be able to solve that and bring it back. Um, so uh, I read it every day, learn today, apply tomorrow. You know, they will definitely tell you that. And um, I think that goes hand in hand with, you know, they will talk um, about our faculty with passion um, you know, many of them, um, you know, forge more like mentor relationships. I mentioned earlier, again, we have a very big focus on the students. Um, there's no bureaucracy at the Jack Welch Management Institute. Um, the folks that are here teaching are really engaged um, because they, they, many of them have spent time in industry and want to bring um, those lessons that they've learned and their real world experiences, you know, back into the classroom in addition to you know, having the PhD credentials, again, goes to support the whole learn today, apply tomorrow. And then I think lastly, you know, when we, when we speak with students, it's, you know, they feel that they graduate with a CEO mindset. Um, probably not surprising since our school was, you know, literally built by the CEO of CEOs um, and brought, again, his focus of 50 years in business and all of the folks that, you know, he had created um, to really teach people how to lead. Um, and I mean, geez, in the world today, you know, it, our, our classes are sort of half business acumen and half the leadership mindset. Um, you know, we, some people call them soft skills, we call them power skills, but it's really learning how to build great teams. So I think, you know, our students will also, will also pair it back one of Jack's most famous phrases, which is before you're a leader, it's all about you. When you become a leader, it's all about your people. I mean, really seeing people embrace that, um, you know, that leadership mindset with the confidence that they can be better leaders. And they now also have the business acumen skills as well to really see the world from the CEO mindset, whether or not they aspire to ever make it to the C-suite. Yeah, that's really good. Uh, and at Hofstra, what are the three things that most seem to resonate with your students? I think a, a few of those are what was mentioned by my peers, which are kind of similar to us. I think the cohort structure really works well for us. Uh, and I don't know, Jody, about the size of your teams there, but you know, if we have a cohort of about 30 students, let's say, it's not very large, obviously, but they build, it's not a team of four or five students, it's a cohort of 30, and they kind of go through the program at the same time. So, that, so the, the way we built it up is that if anybody wants to do this full time and finish it within the, the four semesters, they could stay with the cohort and they really build that relationship and that really resonates a lot. If anybody wants to do it part time, they feel they form their own part time cohort in terms of the courses that they're taking and they get the same experience at the end of the day. 
So I think that resonates a lot, the cohort structure, and to the extent that people don't want to go out of that kind of what Jody was mentioning, they don't want to go out of those cohorts because they know each other so well. Um, so that's one thing. We used to have the global immersion practicum as a mandatory component up until probably two years back when we made it optional. That was an amazing experience for the students. You always hear from them that how great an experience it was. Mm -hmm. and, and the challenge there is to kind of tell the students, you really don't get to see what the value of that immersion is until after you do the immersion. So, um, so it's very difficult for me to say, hey, if we go to this particular location, this is how, what are you gonna see? Well, you can say that, but they're really not experiencing until after they do it. But at the end of the day, when they actually do it, that's the biggest takeaway that they get from the program. And the third thing I would say is the value they get out of the program's courses and the learning that they got. And I could say that because I have, you know, we have about 900 students, you know, in across all the MBA and master's programs we have in the school. And the online MBA is a really small portion of it. You know, if you look at it, the total student body is about 120, 25 across the two years. Um, but easily that's the most consistently, you know, sort of networked student body within that 900 to 1000 student population. And the alums when they graduate or after they graduated from the program, those alums are actually one of the most uh, involved alums back with their alma mater actually, which is kind of interesting because they did it online, hmm. but they seem to have the greatest connection back to the school. So whenever I have to actually reach out to any of those alums, you know, for any help that I may need to come on a panel discussion or talk to a prospective student or, you know, mentor somebody for instance, they are the ones I first go to. And there are always going to be some people that are willing to kind of help. So I think, and the reason they say this is that I got so much value out of the program that I want to give back to the community, you know? So that's kind of, I think those would be the three things. Yes. Great. Now, Sarah, I can imagine what the three things are at Kelly. Uh, let's start with Kelly Connect Weeks. Uh, I'm a, hit the nail on the head. Okay. <laughs> live, the live weekly classes probably would resonate. And then the, the mm -hmm. focus on career management. But let you, I'm going to let you say it, not me. <laughs> well, you hit the nail on the head with the first one. So Kelly on campus, we've actually just recently rebranded our Kelly Connect Week. Um, we're calling Kelly on campus. And Kelly on campus is an opportunity for students to come to the Bloomington, Indiana campus or perhaps another location uh, which is why we're kind of rebranding it and expanding it a little bit uh, now that we're post-COVID. We want to make sure that uh, students get an opportunity to perhaps see the world uh, within this required component of our program if they don't have time to go on immersions later on. So uh, Kelly on Campus is an experience where we do pretty much a case competition uh, within a around four-day period where for your very first Kelly on Campus, you do come to Bloomington, Indiana. And you do the Kelly on Campus experience uh, at the Kelly School of Business. You get to know faculty one on one. You get to know your peers who are in your case competition group. Uh, it's a really intense experience. So it sounds similar um, to what was mentioned by Jody in some of their experiences or that really intense kind of um, relationship building, networking, engagement opportunity. Uh, and then the second Kelly on Campus experience, um, you'll actually go offsite to another location, perhaps around the world, um, but a, definitely another domestic location where you'll be taking a course around uh, megatrends in business uh, at an external location. So we have kind of an opportunity here with Kelly on Campus to build engagement. But then just like you said, the engagement within our program is really key. And the virtual live class sessions is something all of our students say is just an amazing opportunity for networking with their peers, networking with their faculty and getting an opportunity to touch base weekly. And then also that uh, grad career services component that you mentioned. So kind of the third piece here, graduate career services is, um, is accessible in a variety of different ways. We do have our graduate career services office, um, number top ranked grad career services office that uh, works one on one with students. So when you come into the program, you're paired one on one with a career advisor and you have that advisor throughout your program. Um, so students absolutely love that opportunity. We also have one of the largest business school networks in the world with 120,000 Kelly alumni, but about 5,000 uh, Kelly Direct uh, online MBA alumni. And so our students are able to network just throughout the program with our alums and, and again, other current students. And then also built into our curriculum are graduate career services focused courses. So students do take courses, whether or not they want to uh, navigate 
throughout their company, whether, whether or not they're seeking new opportunities, uh, they may want to move into consulting. We have courses that are based on each of those kind of student uh, aspirations. And, and then last but not least, I'm going to tack on one more to the three that you mentioned, and that is our uh, Student Leadership Association. So again, you mentioned earlier those kind of clubs and activities. And what our Student Leadership Association is, it's both a leadership board that provides kind of advising to the Kelly Direct Program Office about things that uh, students are looking for in the program, um, opportunities that they'd like to see with upcoming immersions, those kind of things. But also it's student activities and student activities for adult learners does look very different than a traditional student activities office. Uh, we're bringing in all sorts of guest speakers. They're doing networking nights. Our women in business group has women wine Wednesdays where they get together and just really commiserate on life and how they're making it through this program while raising kids and working full time and you know all of those components. So, uh, and on top of, we have a, a veterans military association, a finance association, uh, a number of different, I think we have 10 associations at this point. So uh, there's other ways to network and get involved than just at those virtual live class sessions. Great. Now, I, I wonder if we can spend a little time on misperceptions. You know, there might be certain assumptions that people make when they hear the word online learning. You know, you go to a colleague and you say, hey, I'm in an online program. And they, and they may immediately think certain things. Now we know the advantages, we've covered them, I think really well. Number one, flexibility, right? You can take the program at your own pace. You can keep your job and your paycheck. Uh, you could do this in a balanced way with your family responsibilities uh, and your professional work. Uh, it's often more affordable, uh, obviously, because there are no opportunity costs and the tuition rates tend to be lower than they will, would be for an on-campus program. Uh, and number three, you know, uh, many people who take these programs grew up with technology. Technology is a part of their life. It will be a part of their life in the new work world. So if you learned before and you played games and you watched shows and you engaged with your family on the internet, why wouldn't you want to learn on the internet? But still, there are certain perceptions and myths about online programming. And I want each of you maybe to address one where you're, you're involved with applicants all the time and I'm sure you get plenty of questions. And I bet you a lot of those questions emanate from a place where, oh, online isn't as good. Oh, uh, online is easy. Oh, online means um, that I don't have to meet hard admission requirements. Online may mean uh, that I'm not gonna be taught by the mainstream faculty. Megan, what's your misperception that you'd like to um, offset? <laughs> and uh, yeah. set people straight on. Yeah, so I, I, I talked about one earlier, which is online is easier. And I think we, you know, kind of chatted through, it's, you know, it's actually not um, just given the amount of requirements that you have to have for accreditation purposes to get quote unquote seat hours in the class. But I think the one that we hear the most and I'll, um, it, and especially because we're an asynchronous program is that you can't create meaningful connections Obviously, the network is a huge reason why, you know, folks go back to get their graduate degree. Yep. Um, and, you know, again, like everything that, that we've done to foster. So we do also have a student and alumni advisory board that I actually am the executive sponsor of. Um, and we've really allowed in this world um, our students to tell us what they need. And then they're now providing the vision for how to support this whole idea of networking in the virtual space. So. We did not build it ourselves and say, here you go. They have helped us over the course of 10 years figure out what that looks like. And it's really created a passionate base of folks all around the world who want to help and want to be able to meet and network with their peers. Um, we have about 50 city ambassadors. So in non-COVID days, um, you know, we have folks hosting on-ground uh, on events. We have a global day of networking. We've uh, turn that virtual. And our last event, we had over 300 people attend throughout the day. We, we run mm. it from six in the morning to, you know, eight o'clock at night Eastern time to catch everybody. So, you know, it's been very exciting, I think, for us to, to really work with our students to figure out what networking means virtually, because it is, you know, it is very different. And for some, they just might want to have you know, coffee every Friday, first Friday of the month, which we have. Other folks want to be more, you know, intimately involved as one of our ambassadors or on the student and alumni advisory board. 
Um, and then obviously exchange, you know, extends to the classroom. Um, again, those small class sizes, you know, it's about, we have about 19 students in each class. So they really get to know one another in the classes. Um, and they're all facilitating each other's learnings because peer, mm. peer responses and discussions are another way. So people are, you know, they're getting kind of the social element from all the things that we do outside in the class, outside the classroom and inside both with their faculty members and their peers, just in the small setting and the way that the courses are designed. They get to know each other a lot better than frankly you would if you were sitting in a lecture hall, um, you know, not speaking and kind of sitting in the back because you just can't do that in the online environment. So I think it's really that, that level of personal connection that we see folks really surprised at how, how deep the relationships that they're able to build are um, in the asynchronous, specifically asynchronous model. Jody, you have your chance to be a myth buster. What <laughs> myth do you want to bust? I think the one that comes up the most when I'm interviewing prospective students is um, that, that they're going to be a passive learner. Um, and to try to explain to them that that is not the expectation. The expectation is that they will be called on. They will be um, leading teams within the, each course. Um, um, this is not a passive program. You are very actively engaged. And, and a lot of that, like I mentioned earlier, we're, we're mapping out and charting um, student engagement in classes and faculty members are doing that too. So there is an expectation you come prepared. Um, it's a very rigorous program in that sense. Um, you know, there is an expectation that you're going to contribute um, because, you know, like all the programs, um, you're going to take what you're learning in the classroom and apply it tomorrow at work. Um, and so the professors want to hear about that and they want to know um, what you're learning at work and how that's applied. Um, so um, I think that's probably the biggest one I get rigor. And then the other one that kind of trickles in from time to time is how much contact am I really going to have with the faculty? And I try to explain to them, that's up to you. Um, the faculty are so, um, so engaged with the students. They want to hear from them. And I think there's a little intimidation at first, like these are big deal people. Um, but what they don't realize is that they are just, um, you know, dying to get an email from a student. They want to help. Um, I've never met a group of people, and I'm sure at the other schools it's the same way, that that you know, sure they're doing their research, but teaching is the core of who they are and why they're here. And so to be able to really engage and develop that network with our students, um, they love that level of engagement. The more they get engaged with the students, the, the happier they are. So I think those would probably be um, the ones I, I hear about the most. Yeah, those are good. Uh, Kossuth, how about you? Yeah, I'm going to piggyback on Jody's point. As a professor, I'll tell you, my happiest research projects, the last two ones that I'm currently working on, are with two of my online MBA program alums. You know, they are in healthcare. They reached out back to me to kind of engage, you know, on the research projects. And it's just been fun experience to work with them. So you're very right, Jody, that uh, we as professors would like the students to get back to us. I would like to kind of point out to one thing. I think that was mentioned probably by Megan also that, you know, um, when I teach an in-person class, I get the students uh, during the week for about two hours and 20 minutes, which is our class duration, once a week. When I'm teaching online, uh, I'm getting them for the entire seven days. And so from the student's perspective, the learning, uh, and we've felt this and we've discussed this within the faculty group uh, at our school, that we feel the learning is much deeper in the online program. Um, we feel that the, the students get an, uh, an opportunity to you know, like if, if you're talking about a particular topic in a discussion forum, and that discussion is going on for three, four days during the week, uh, you get a chance as a student to actually not just read what others are posting, but also do some research on your own and provide your own thoughts. Now, in an in-person course, that's practically not possible to do it in a two-hour session. So at the end of the day, I feel that, you know, the students actually learn better there, which is probably something that the student enrolling in an online program may not think about it from that perspective when they actually start the program. But as they go through the program's courses, they feel, oh, I'm getting a really good level of learning. And of course, they don't have a direct experience of comparing it to an in-person setting. But we always say this to them that, you know, we're talking about this for three, four days, you know, for 24 hours during those three, four days. And you're not going to get the same level of discussion as you'd get, you know, uh, in an online setting. So I think that's one myth buster, John, if, if I want to kind of point to that. And of course, that goes back to that point. You need to be an active learner in the classroom. Yeah. You're not doing this passively. Yeah. 
and I'll piggyback on that and say, you know, another advantage related to what you've just said is the fact that you can rerun something. Like even if it's a live class and you didn't quite get something, you can go back and relive it again. It's not a one-time experience and then you're out and you know whatever was absorbed was absorbed and gone. Uh, you literally can go back again and again uh, and with your classmates if you wanted to, uh, to, to capture something that you didn't quite totally understand or get. Sarah, here's your chance to bust a myth. Sure, so I'm gonna um, bring up some myths that actually tie together all the themes that my colleagues have all brought up because a couple of the myths that we hear is that online learning is lonely. That hmm. I'm going to be just kind of alone in my house doing this you know, thing and not really connecting and what does this feel like? You know, They're on the other side of the screen so it kind of brings in the ideas that Jody and Megan were bringing up around, no, actually it's, it's really engaging. And it is, we've heard from many of our students and alums that they feel more connected to their classmates in our program than they did doing their in-person undergraduate degree or in-person master's degree. So I think that's really key. And then another thing that, uh, that fits to what Kelsey brought up around the I've actually taken some online courses throughout my educational career that I referred to as discussion board yuck. It was discussion <laughs> board after discussion board after discussion board. And then I would have to go do the class reading and read the reading and then come back and read the discussion board. And it was just like, I couldn't, I couldn't read anymore, right? I, I, I'd gotten to the point where I'd, I, I'd taken it all in and I didn't feel like I was really being able to give anything back that is the opposite of our online learning experience. And I'm sure the, the courses that are offered in, in uh, my colleagues' programs are similar and that online learning has evolved. It is not discussion board yuck anymore. There are so many ways to engage in an online environment. Websites, apps, all of these new learning technologies that fit along with more traditional forms of engagement like group projects and you know just team assignments and things like that. So we have a lot of ways that we are engaging students. Every faculty member does it a little bit differently and they may engage and most likely engage lots of different mediums throughout their one course. So it's the virtual live session, it's the asynchronous component and that might be readings, that might be watching a lecture, that might be engaging in your group project but it is so much more than just sitting there reading, 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 scrolling through discussion boards and feeling like you just can't take it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Now, uh, an, an, another issue with online uh, programs, and this is something that I'm sure many applicants and even students bring up, is this. Obviously, everyone is employed in an online MBA program, or virtually everyone. Uh, so that means you don't have to place them into jobs as you would in a full-time MBA program. Uh, so there is this belief out there that if you want to accelerate your existing career, you do a part-time or online MBA degree. If you want to do a career switch, meaning change discipline, change industry, change company, even change geography, uh, you might be more suited for a full-time MBA program. Is that belief still true in online MBAs? Jody? Um, I guess what, what I see is that with the students in our program come to us, um, most of them um, want to pivot or advance, right? Um, like you said, they already have, you know, pretty much a solid career. However, we do, we do get students in the program that are starting out three to five years work experience. So, um, you know, they're just trying to, I believe, you know, really develop themselves a little bit more so they can get into a leadership role where the majority of our students are already in that leadership role. And so they're just trying to pivot maybe into another industry. I have had students who, you know, literally pivot, um, you know, they, they're in sales and they want to get into finance. So that's a, a complete pivot. So, um, and, you know, 70% of our students um, change careers or advance um, within the program or a year after, which is, which was when I got here, that, that number was just flabbergasting to me. I didn't realize mm -hmm. how many students, so they must come here with that goal in mind, right? I want to pivot. I want to advance. 
Um, and, and to know that we're supporting, you know, 70 plus percent of them to be able to do that makes me feel really good. Um, I'm not sure that in the, in the traditional full-time MBA, you're going to see that kind of career progression and career growth. Um, and my guess would be just because the students in that program maybe aren't um, experienced in leadership and in, in their work career already, but um, I guess that's what it was. Sarah, do you have a take on that question? I do actually, and um, this is always a tricky one because it's so dependent on the context of, of the applicant. So we actually utilize our enrollment interview as an opportunity to talk through a little bit what this applicant is looking for, because there are plenty of times where we have recommended our full-time program. Um, if for someone who is looking for a complete career switch, uh, particularly if they might be an early career professional and don't have a, a very robust resume at that point, and that they really need to figure out kind of, do they need an internship to actually get the experience they need to get a, a strong role in the industry that they're looking to go into? And again, our Graduate Career Services Office is, is key in this entire process. So whether or not they choose our, our online program or to go into our full-time program, uh, either way, they're working with their career coach uh, pretty much from the start of their program. And we have kind of a pathway designed, our five-phase career model uh, that fits each different scenario. So we have a, kind of a pathway for those who are looking to advance in their current company, one who are looking for a total career switch. So it, again, it's just kind of dependent on the student and their needs. And we make sure that we check that out at the get-go uh, to make sure that they're in the program that's the right fit for their career goals. Yeah. Um, Kasek, what do you think? Um, I'm going to kind of leverage what my colleagues said here also, that there are folks who are not looking for a career switch in our program, uh, but there's also a good group of folks who are actually looking for that. And many of them looking for a lateral shift uh, into um, a position that may not have been available to them without the MBA, let's say. So, uh, and a lot of them are coming to our career services to do consultation on things like resume critic and doing a mock interview and those kind of things. So um, we do have uh, more students who are coming in at least the last two years or so who have less work experience. Our average experience has been around 13, 14 years in terms of the profile of the students. It has gone down a little bit, but not too much because we, we're getting a few more folks with the lower experience and they are actively obviously looking for, um, for new opportunities. So, so we have a mix there and you know, with healthcare, again, the focus over the last year, there's a lot of folks in healthcare for, in our student body who want to get out of healthcare or at least get out of the clinical portion and go more into administrative. I've had students asking me, can I get out of healthcare and do something on my own, which is not in healthcare because they got so frustrated with the experience last year and they don't want to deal with it anymore. So we do have, Sarah was pointing this out, it really depends on the individual person. Right. Megan, are you suited for career switchers or for career accelerators? Yeah, I mean, we see a lot of both. Um, and also entrepreneurs, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, so they, they're probably, you know, uh, you know, somewhat. So I think like our colleagues, again, we serve working professionals, about 75% of them are getting raises and promotions, um, you know, while they're enrolled. Um, again, I find that those that fit into that bucket are, are either coming because they, you know, uh, have uh, are very functional focused, but they lack broader business acumen skills. So they may be somebody in marketing who doesn't really understand the, you know, how to read the PNL, um, or they're folks who find themselves, you know, liking what they do functionally, but have, you know, never had any management training. Um, and so our program right. helps provide and round out that perspective. Um, a lot of our students just get inspired. They're making connections within the classroom. Um, we've had many students start their own businesses once they go through our entrepreneurship class and capstone class because they've now been taught how to build a business plan from a from the correct perspective. And so we're seeing that group, um, you know, really take off, um, you know, from that perspective. And I'd say the folks that generally are are the career switchers, we now are, like I said, expanding our concentrations. So a lot of folks, we now have opportunities, for example, if you do want to go into healthcare. Um, or you do want to move into HR more broadly into operations, um, we are now really building out that functional expertise that can hit, help you make that transition. So it's not a one size, and that's the great thing about online, it's, it's really not a one size you know, fits all you know, solution for folks and it's very dependent on the individual. Great. Well, listen, it's been a real pleasure to spend this time with all four of you. I think we had a great session. 
uh, and we got into everything about how, how, you know, one online MBA program isn't the same as another. And that's what I want people to really understand because um, the variety and the different choices that you have are uh, spectacular for people to make sure that the right fit is just for them. Uh, so thank you very much for all that. And I wanna remind everyone out there that you can ask questions about each of these programs. Um, each of our panelists will be now in a breakout room for 30 minutes to answer any questions you might have about their program or you know, online learning in general. Uh, these are all experts in the field, uh, know a lot, and you could benefit from that knowledge and make sure you make the right choice for yourself. Uh, and if you missed part of this incredible discussion, you can watch it on demand, which is another beautiful thing. You know, I mentioned one of the great advantages of an online MBA program is that you can rerun a lesson. If you didn't get it the first time, go for it the second time, even the third time. Well, you can do that with our panel discussion as well. So, hey, thanks for watching. Thanks for participating. Jody, Sarah, Megan, and Kazakh, thank you so much for your time. Have a wonderful day.